welcome to NSTA Podcasts. In this segment, Joe Krejcik will talk about strategies for supporting students. Student challenges is using evidence to support their ideas. Uh, uh, we don't want them just to rely only on their opinion. Uh, explaining why their evidence supports their ideas is also very challenging to kids. Uh, they can have difficulty articulating the links or using scientific principles actually to show why the evidence that they're using is indeed uh, appropriate evidence. Uh, often, uh, as I said before, so they want to focus just on one idea so they're not considering alter alternative claims. Re revising your arguments, again, getting kids to go back and look at new evidence and say, how might I change this? And certainly listening to what others say and taking their points of view into consideration. These are all aspects that students find very, very challenging within the classroom. And so here, here are some ways in which you might support kids in this process. And the first one is providing them with a framework. I'm going to actually go, I'm not going to be able to go over all these, but I'm going to try to go over most of these. But what the, so I'll read these uh, quickly through and then uh, pick out a couple to focus on. The first one is providing a framework. What do you really expect kids to do? And I'll talk about some pitfalls of that as well. You want to, in some respects, provide a model and describe that framework. You want to provide them with examples. You want to let them know why it's important. Um, fifth, you, uh, why is it important to engage in argument? Five, have them critique each other's written arguments. Allow them to actually debate ideas in school, in, in the classroom, and provide them with various scaffolds. So I'm going to now go into these in some, in some depth. So the first one was uh, actually present them with a framework. And uh, I, I think now for the last 12 years, I've been working with Kate McNeil on this process of claim evidence and reasoning. Uh, we've, we've expanded it, of course, to go beyond just explanation and actually to take into consider counterclaims and rebuttals. And a claim is always a statement about a question or some problem. Evidence, as I said, uh, is, the, the, is uh, the data that is appropriate and sufficient to support that claim. And the reasoning is a justification that shows why that data counts as evidence to support the claim and includes appropriate scientific principles. The counterclaim describes other possible claims, like, well, it could be this, but maybe, you know, maybe it's not. The rebuttals are, I mean, if someone gives you a counterclaim, the rebuttal is it provides uh, counter evidence and reasoning why that alternative or counterclaim is not appropriate. So these are these in some you can think in some respects are the are things that go into writing taking part in argument. But one of the things I want to warn you about is we don't want to make this into a fill in the blank or a rubric in some respects and give this process and not have kids realize that this, in some respects, is very dynamic and, and flows together. In the beginning, to have kids really realize that what's a claim, we actually want to talk about it as answering a question. We want to help them understand what evidence is. But in the end, we want to avoid this sort of lockstep procedure in this, the way I have it framed here. So we don't want to make this into an algorithmic formula, because then that destroys what argumentation is really all about. On the other hand, as teachers, we do want to help them understand what these various parts are. So uh, this is an example of modeling and describing the framework. Uh, one, one way that actually works very nicely is actually by using common examples. And so here's a common example. Uh, this is actually a, 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 an actual example from a, a classroom teacher. And the teacher says, uh, so if I say Brett Favre is the best quarterback that she loves Brett Favre, by the way, as a quarterback, she says, if Brett Favre is the best quarterback that ever lived, if I made that claim, what is that an answer to? And the student says, who's the best quarterback? So she's trying to get the kids to realize that claims respond to questions. And the teacher says, yeah, who's the best quarterback? So I think Brett Favre is the best quarterback that ever lived. Uh, the teacher goes on, so if I'm going to make a claim, such as the one I did with about Brett Farr, what would you have to say to me? And Sean said, well, that's just an opinion. Well, which it is. But the teacher says, that's an opinion. Well, what else would you want to know from me? 
to support that claim. And a number of students said the facts, the data, and the teacher says, yeah, right, facts and data, not necessarily opinions. So if I'm going to back up with facts or data, what do you call that? And then the kids go on and say, well, that's evidence. So often modeling and providing examples, common examples initially on, can really help kids uh, understand what this framework might look like. And I'd like to just uh, thank Ann Novak for that example. Ann's a teacher uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So one of the other things we really want to do is allow kids to debate ideas. And in order to do that in our classroom, we actually have to give our kids permission to disagree. O often a lot of the students who are in front of us come from cultures and backgrounds that it's inappropriate to disagree, particularly in a formal setting like a classroom. So we have to help our kids understand that, you know, this is science class, and in science class, all students have a voice about, is this the best claim? Because in here, what we're going to do is we're going to raise questions, and we're going to look for what's the evidence. So we want to try to make sh we we have to give our kids permission. And that, and you have to do that as a teacher. If we don't give them permission, we're not going to see this kind of argumentation happen in our classroom. And of course, if we do that, that's establishing a norm. But we also have to establish norms for acceptable behavior. And of course, one of the things is, is it's not that it's just my opinion or it's Joe that's saying this because Joe's the bright guy in the classroom. It's whoever makes a claim has to use it has to provide evidence and reasoning and justification for their claims. And part of that norm building is not ever to allow kids to put other students down, because that's going to just shut certain kids up. And it's probably going to make quiet the kids that you don't want to have quiet. We want all kids to participate in this. So this norm of respecting each other is critical. Uh, and that one of those ideas are putting ideas down and also getting kids not to talk when someone else is talking. These are important norms that if you really want to have this process of argumentation happen in your classroom, you have, to, you have to help your kids realize. And of course, part of all this is really helping kids listen, learn to listen because it's just not natural. Right? We, we want to get our, our, our ideas. We don't want to listen to what Jackie has to say or what Sam has to say. We want to sort of just get out our ideas. So we have to help kids listen. And there are techniques that we can do that. You know, you could, we could do stuff like, oh, my idea is similar to Jessica's idea because. Oh, my idea is different from Ann's idea because. Right? So there's certain little helpful techniques that we can actually use to get kids to actually try and listen to one another. Another example that we can do, and of course what I, what I tried to do just there was give you some scaffolds. Scaffolds are, sort of, are supports that can help kids do things that they normally can't do. And they're called scaffolds because often we want to remove those scaffolds. But in the beginning, when we're actually working with kids, we want to provide them with scaffolds. So here's a variety of different questions that we could use uh, hopefully early on and hopefully we can fade these as time goes on. But as teachers, we could, when a student makes a claim, what evidence do you have? Why do you agree or disagree? What are your reasons? What is your evidence? What could be some other possible claims? Do you have evidence for that other possible claim? Do you agree with the points being made? Why? Who has a different opinion? Why are you using that as evidence and not other data? How would your claim change if you used all the data? Does that make a difference? How is your idea related to what was previously discussed? What reasons do you have for saying that? So as a teacher, particularly early on as we try to engage our kids in this dialogical discourse in our classroom, we have to provide these supports. Because if we don't, then we're not going to see this kind of give and take that we want kids actually to be able to do in our classes. So uh, I'm just going to back up a little bit. There, there was one uh, that I, a bullet that I um, didn't, don't have a slide for, but I do want to talk about it just for a second. And that is that we really want to explain to kids 
why we're doing this. And in fact, Kate and I have some really interesting data that as teachers, if we don't provide a rationale for why we're doing this, and we do more of a just have them do claim evidence and reasoning more kind of a, as a procedural type of thing, kids actually do worse on tests, on achievement tests than they do if we provide reasoning for why we're doing this and using some of these scaffolds. So again, some of the reasons why we're doing this is because we really want to try to figure out what's the best possible explanation. This is what actually scientists do. So we want to always try to reinforce those ideas as well.